So, <coughs> here we are. We find ourselves in that after Christmas space. You know, you had three, four weeks, five weeks maybe of building up to, to Christmas. You've had decorations at your home. You've seen decorations in stores since like before Halloween. But you've had this massive build up Christmas in church. We've been talking about it since after Thanksgiving. We've been decorated since after Thanksgiving. Um, in the coming days, the decorations will be gone from church, from your home. I bet some of y'all took them down yesterday. We started taking stuff down, probably. It's warm outside. You do some stuff. But, you know, you, you get this, this space now, and it's kind of, I mean, quite frankly, it can be a little bit of a, an emotional letdown. Yeah. You can kind of maybe hit some doldrums, perhaps, and, and, and kind of feel down. Spiritually, that can happen as well. Because uh, undoubtedly, over the past few weeks, for, for many people, it's been a, a high time spiritually. There, there's been cantatas and Christmas plays, and not just that they're different, but they communicate good messages in, in different ways. Uh, there's been, you know, we've had, we had a wonderful Christmas Eve service, and just, just high, wonderful times of, of worship. And, and people go to a place spiritually where perhaps they don't go other times of the year. Clearly, there would be people who uh, come to church during Christmas time and we don't see them much throughout the rest of the year. And so today, I ask the question, spiritually, after Christmas, what? After Christmas, what? What will happen? What will, what will be the impact of Christmas on people? What will be the impact of Christmas on you and others around the world this year? And for that, we're going to study a passage that's familiar to many of you. But in Matthew chapter 2, where we read of the, the wise men, the magi, and coming to, to see Jesus after his birth. And let's make sure we all get it. Even though we have them in here, we have them in this, in this nativity scene, and you see them in, in many nativity scenes. You see the, the wise men here with little baby Jesus in, in the manger. Guess what? You know about after the Christmas quiz. That ain't true. All right? They got there perhaps up to two years later, two years after his birth. They visited in, in a house that Joseph and Mary had, had moved into by this time. So it really is an after Christmas scripture passage that we're studying today. And it really is an after Christmas spiritual question that we're asking and answering today. And so we'll, we'll see several Several characters, sets of characters in this passage today that we can glean some information on, on how people will respond after Christmas. So, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler, who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, 
And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can study this, this scripture today, this, this actual account of, of what happened with the Magi and Herod and <clears throat> the scribes and Pharisees. And Father, that we are able to look at this and, and learn for ourselves. We're grateful, God, that your word is, is living and active and, and applies to our lives today. I pray that as we study this today, we can each uh, take something from it that, that helps us to, to worship you, that helps us to, to grow more like you in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, after Christmas, <coughs> then what? First thing we'll see is that some people will worship Jesus. So after spending this time of, of, of Christmas, this time of, of singing about and learning about and uh, hearing everyone talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, some people will in fact continue to worship Him. Hopefully most everyone here, hopefully everyone here is in that group that you will continue to worship Him. You will continue to make Him the center of your life, where you will continue to make him more and more the center of your life. The, the one who, who drives what you do. And I think that's what we see in this group of magi. That even before seeing him, he was one who was driving their lives. Now, who in the world are these magi? We're not going to necessarily dig into all of that today, but just a, a brief understanding of who they are. They weren't kings. There's another fallacy we see in, in, in what we sing. That they weren't kings. They weren't three kings. We don't even know that there are three of them. I mean, we often say it's three because of the number of gifts that were brought. But the magi were most likely and most often are thought to be astrologers. They were, they, were, they were men who, who studied the heavens, studied the stars, and made predictions. Some even called them magicians. So, you know, part of, part of their background is not necessarily a, what we might call it, a Christian background, because magi in general were, were folks who would, uh, you know, as they're, as they're studying the sky, studying the stars, studying the heavens, they would also be looking at various religions and texts and, and seeing, trying to figure out what's going on in, in the heavens and, and, and sometimes make assertions as to what might happen on the earth because of that. Now, I believe, based on what we read here, based on what we understand, most likely what's going on with this particular group of magi, that they were introduced to the Old Testament scriptures <clears throat> when the, the Medes invaded and took over Babylon in the time of Daniel, when Daniel was, was there. And through Daniel's service, through his witness, through his time there, he impacted many, many people in, in, in teaching them about the scriptures. Had quite an influence. And so probably what happened with, with these magi from the east, from Persia, Iran, Iraq, that area of, of, of the world is, is what we're talking about. There's this lasting influence for, for about 500 years is, what, is the time span we're talking about here. So there's this lasting influence from, from, from Daniel 
and his impact to the Magi that we're studying in Matthew chapter 2. And so they, they had, had spent time reading the scriptures. And apparently, I'm thinking, their hearts and minds had been captured by this coming Messiah. Their hearts and minds had been captured by the, the promise of this king of the Jews who was to come. I say that because I think, why else would you travel for months across the desert to see a child who had been born? Unless it really meant something to you. I don't think they were in the, in the practice of doing that with every baby, royal baby that was born on the earth during that time. They weren't in that practice. I believe that if, if nothing else, this particular group of Magi who came to worship the King of the Jews had been influenced, impacted, and their lives changed by the Old Testament scriptures that they had been studying and had even at this point made the object of their lives coming to worship the King. Can you see, I mean, can you see that? I think that's at the heart of what's going on with the Magi here. I, 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 don't think you, I don't think you go to that length. I don't think anyone goes to that trouble to see someone just to be doing it. Maybe, maybe sometimes people do that. I don't, I don't know. But, but, but I think what's going on here is that these Magi had made Jesus Christ the object of their worship, the center of their lives. That's what they did after Christmas. That's why they embarked on this trek across the desert. That's why they followed the star in the sky. That's why they went to him. Because he had become the driving force in their lives. After Christmas, will he be the driving force in your life? Will he be the object of your worship? Will he be the one that influences the decisions you make? Will he be the one that influences your thinking on an everyday basis? See, this is, this is what it means to, to worship him. This is the idea, the picture of, of true worship. It, it's not just going through religious rites and religious ceremonies. We'll see in a minute a group of people who do that. But the, the contrast between that group and this group of Magi is that they are a group of people whose lives were dedicated to worshiping this king. Will that be said of you? Will you be in that group? Or will you be in this group that kind of misses the big idea? Will you be in the group that, that misses the big idea of Christmas? You see that when the, when the Magi arrive, they, they go to, they go, and, and they're asking everyone, really, you know, where, where is the one who is the king, of, who's been born king of the Jews? Where is, where is, where is? He? I'm quite sure that they're expecting people to know. I mean, they've come all this way, they've been studying the scriptures and, and have figured out and have known that hey, he's been born. There's this, this star in the sky. Doesn't everyone see that? Doesn't everyone know what that means, or at least wonder what that means? Everyone's got to be looking for this king of the Jews. Most of, at least the Jews got to be looking for the king of the Jews, right? That, that's, what the, that's what the Magi are thinking when they arrive here. And they're all around the town asking, where is he, where is he, where is he? And no one knows. No one can tell them. So they go to, they go to the king Herod. Hey, where is he? And boy, that just throws everyone into, into a tizzy. Most assuredly it throws Herod into, into a tizzy. And Herod's like, what, what do you mean, king of the Jews? What do you mean? And of course, he, he puts on a front. He's like, oh, my goodness, I, I'd like to know too. I, I'd like to join you in worshiping this, this king of the Jews. I, I'd like to join you in acknowledging him. I, I'm all for it. Of course, that's, we'll see that's not his, his real heart's desire. But he, 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 has, he has a desire to find out where he is. And so, what does he do? He calls on the people that ought to know where this 
where this king is, where this king of the Jews is. He calls on, on the scribes. He calls on the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbi. He calls on the people in the know. He calls on the people who are the experts of the law, the experts of the Old Testament scriptures. And he says, where is he? Where is he? Now, they don't go to their experience of having God seen him because they haven't. They don't say, oh, listen, we, you know, we, we were there when he was born because we saw all the signs and, and we were there. Let, let me tell you where he is. They don't say, hey, we were, we were there just last week making sure everything was okay with, with the young Messiah, making sure his parents are, are cared for and they have everything they need. They, they don't say that because guess what? They weren't there. The same signs that the Magi had seen, the star in the sky, the scripture that they had been studying from afar all this time, is the same scripture that the, the pros here in, in Israel had been at, had at their fingertips anyway to study. And supposedly they had been. They're experts. Because guess what? They knew right where to go. They knew where to go <coughs> to find in the scriptures some information about what the scriptures said, where this child would be, where he could be found. And so they went to it. And when they found the information, they, they told Herod, they told the Magi. And of course, the Magi went to do what? To worship. What did the Pharisees do? What did the Sadducees do? What did the rabbis do? What did the scribes do? They missed the big idea. Oh, we're, we'll tell these guys where the king of the Jews is so they can go worship him. We'll tell these guys where our king is so they can go worship him. We'll tell these guys where our Messiah is so they can go worship him. And we'll just stay right here. We're, we're good with where we are. That's cool. I'm good. I'm good. We're good. Yeah. I'm all set. Some people in Maine said, you know, years ago went on a mission, mission trip to Maine and said, hey, who is Jesus to you? Oh, I'm all set. I'm good. I don't need to know about Jesus. You've met people. You've talked to people. You have, you try to, you're having a conversation about the things of Christ and you say, I'm good. I'm good. They missed the big idea. These Pharisees, you said these, these pros at the law, these pros of the scripture, these who had studied the scripture, who, who knew the scriptures, who knew where to look, they missed the big idea. Here was an opportunity for them to go worship the king. And they didn't do it. They were satisfied with their head knowledge of the scriptures. They had no interest at all in having a heart knowledge, but having a transformation of their hearts and lives and minds by interacting with the king. By selling out their lives like these magi had done to come and see and worship the king. No clue, no interest, no desire. They missed the big idea. Hopefully not, but will you be in that group? Do you know people who might be in that group? Who missed the big idea? Maybe, maybe, maybe you know people who do the religious stuff, but they missed the big idea. They, they, they come to church services, but they missed the big idea. There, there is no relationship with Jesus. There, there's no true worship of, of the king. There's no, not even true desire to worship the king, they're satisfied with where they are. I'm good. I'm all set. Is that you or someone you know? If that is you, if that is someone you know, then, then friends, we ought not be satisfied with that because that's not a saving place. That's not a surrendered place. That's not a place of salvation that you find yourself. So, so I encourage you I, I plead with you, don't settle for that place if that's where you find yourself.
There's yet another group that, that we see in the scripture that we study today. And that group is most assuredly identified by Herod in the scripture today. But there's a group after Christmas who will seek to destroy the Messiah. There's a group who will seek to destroy him and everything about him. And that's what we find out about Herod. Even as Herod is having conversation with the Magi and, and telling them and, and the fair, hey, let's find out where he is so, so I too can go worship him. I, I want to worship him as well. I want to I be right there. But then as we continue reading the scriptures, we find that, that Herod's true desire is to destroy him. And why does he want to destroy the king? Because he's the king. Because he's a, put, been put in this place by the Roman government to be king of the Jews. And that's in quotations because he's not so much a king as he is a puppet of Rome, as, as a governor perhaps you might say. But in the least, what will happen is if he, he feels threatened by this one who is king. He doesn't want to worship him. He wants to destroy him. Because if this one really is the king, guess what it will do to Herod? It will change his lifestyle. It will destroy his lifestyle. It will take away everything that he desires. Everything that he wants to hold on to. And so instead of giving up self, instead of denying himself and following this new king, guess what he wants to do? He wants to destroy this king. He wants to make sure that there's no mark of this king anywhere in anyone's life, much less his life. He wants to make sure that there's, there's no evidence, there's no semblance of, of influence from this king in his life or anyone else's life. <clears throat> there are people today, the majority of people today, want to destroy the king. The world we live in wants to destroy the influence and impact of King Jesus. The world we live in today seeks to destroy the influence and impact of King Jesus in our world. We see that he, he we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about this, but we, and we'll have to continue talking about it, because we see the impact of removing King Jesus, we see the impact of removing uh, a, a biblical worldview from our laws, from our government. And the impact of that is that it takes us down a road that sees no end towards moral compromise, towards humanism, because we remove God, and guess who has to be the center? Man. When we remove biblical worldview and, and, and biblical values, What's left at the center, what's left as the focus to build everything on, government-wise, law-wise, is man. And what we know about man from the scriptures is that man, since the Garden of Eden, since the fall of man, man is evil. Man is in need of a savior. But when man then says, I'm destroying that savior, I'm removing every bit of evidence and every bit of impact and every bit of influence of that Savior, the man just heads down this road towards self-destruction. Although all the while heading down this road, guess what man says? Look at this beautiful road we're building. Look at this, look at this great society. Look at this great world that we're building. Man looks around and says, man is getting better. Man looks around and says, man is good. Because man has attempted to remove the influence and impact of King Jesus. So you see, it's not just at the heart, really, the reality is, at the heart of every man, every man in his natural fallen state is a desire to destroy King Jesus. But praise God that he persists in pursuing us 
He persists in pursuing us and saving some and redeeming some so that we're not seeking to destroy Him, but seeking to worship Him. The reality is that two of the groups that we've talked about today, and it's clearly the group that seeks to destroy Him, that, that makes no bones about it, and the group that misses the big idea, both of these groups lead to the destruction of, of King Jesus. The, the end of both of these is, is the destruction uh, and, and, and reduction of influence and impact of King Jesus in our society. Both of the, the, the one who misses the big idea, says, I'm good where I am, and the one that just flat out says, Jesus, no. And that's the world that most of us live in. Okay? As, I've taught, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I'm pretty sure and I hope and, and I'm, I'm pretty positive that most of whom I'm talking today, talking to today, you are the group that says we will worship it. That's one group. That's one third of the groups I've talked about today. So we're outnumbered. Two thirds of the people. And probably when you look at statistics, it's about like that. Two-thirds, if not more, of the people in our world today are in that group that ultimately seeks to destroy his impact and influence. That leaves us with some odds stacked against us, it may seem. But we've got to remember that we're not in it alone. You see, if... if if we start thinking that we're in it alone, if we start looking merely at the numbers, then what do we start doing? We start reducing the impact and influence of Jesus Christ in our own lives. So as we're talking about that, we've got to remember that, yeah, the, the numbers, boy, if, if it was a football game, if it was a, any other type of competition, we might think, boy, this is going to be tough. The numbers are stacked against us. But we must remember that those who will worship him, we have him. We have him on our side. We have him on our side. We're on his side. We're on his side. And the question is, as I consider how I will worship him, really the question I'm asking and you should be asking is, how will I allow him to use me? How much more of my life will I give him? Because the reality is, if I haven't given him all, and most of us probably haven't, that's where I need to be. That's where I want to strive to be. To give him all, to surrender, to sell out, and say, yeah, I'll follow that star. I'll travel across that desert. I'll put up with whatever talk I have to put up with. With whatever change I have to put up with and go through. I will do that because I am sold out. I am dedicated to Him. Well, I miss the big idea. Well, I seek to destroy it. Or... Does the light have to go out? Will I be the light that others can look to? 
Well, I'll be the light that others can follow after Christmas to the Messiah, to the King. You see, these magi we've been talking about, they followed a the star that stayed lit for at least two years, perhaps, after Christmas. After Christmas, that star stayed lit. <coughs> that star stayed bright, <coughs> leading the way to the Messiah. After Christmas, as you say, yes, I will worship him, understand that you, you just may be the light that someone needs to follow to truly know and worship the Messiah. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that, uh, that we can even talk about a Christmas. Because in talking about and celebrating over the past few weeks Christmas, we, we recognize in that that you did not desert us. That seeing our, our state as, as fallen people, you did not say, oh well, they had their chance. They've got to live in it now. I'll just let them eat and destroy themselves. No, Father, even before that happened, you had a plan. You had a plan for Christmas. To send them aside, to send the one who would be our Savior. To deliver us <laughs> from this place we found ourselves in. Father, we're thankful as well that we can celebrate after Christmas. That you give us a purpose. Give us a purpose as your children. As ones who have been saved and called out by you. you give us a purpose to be a light. Reflecting your light. But a light that will shine so that others can find their way to the Messiah. Father, I pray that you use us. Use each and every one of us this year to lead people to you. Use us, Father, so that people will, will be added to your kingdom so that we can celebrate you even more with more brothers and sisters. We lift our <coughs> praises and glory and honor to you. Father, we pray this for your glory, for your honor. Not so that we can say we've added this many to this church or that many to that church, but so that we can say that your kingdom has grown for your glory and for your honor. We pray this in Jesus' name.